Hey everyone, Bob Roberts here. In today's lessons, we are gonna go from the dark space to the brightest objects in our universe. Now, objects that we can see for billions of light years away. Those objects are, of course, the stars. But what exactly is a star? Now, a star is a massive body of super hot gases. It's basically an incredible nuclear power plant that can create its own self-sustaining reaction and generates its own light. Planets, on the other hand, are dark and cannot generate their own light in any large scale. Now, a volcano eruption can be seen near the surface of a planet, but it doesn't have enough magnitude to be able to be seen farther away. So when you see a planet in the sky, what you're really seeing is the light coming from a star, reflecting off of a planet and bouncing back to your eye. Now, it's frankly amazing to me to think about the fact that you have this proton that can take hundreds tens of thousands of years to make its way to the surface of a star and ultimately escape our sun, travel to a distant planet, and our solar system bounce off that planet, then travel to our planet and precisely meet your eye, which has to be in the exact right position. If it wasn't, it would be absorbed by your t-shirt or the ground. It really is such a cool thought. So anyways, it also goes to show you how many protons are actually being sent from a star. When you travel to a location that doesn't have a lot of light pollution, like a remote field away from many cities, and you are able to see the night sky, all of the stars that you can see dotting that night sky are the stars that are in our own Milky Way galaxy. Stars from outside our galaxy are simply too far away to get enough light from them to see with our unaided eyes. And even most of the stars in our own galaxy are not bright enough to see without a telescope. The stars that are even closest to our own are not even bright enough to be seen unaided. So what you really are seeing with your eyes at night are only the very brightest and biggest stars in our galaxy. Now, the distances between the stars and the galaxies in the universe are simply hard to wrap your head around. We can't think in miles or kilometers. Instead, we have to think about how far light itself can travel in a year and use that as a specific measurement. Now, a light year is incredibly fast. It travels about 186,000 miles in just one second. That's about 670 and a half million miles per hour. Now the distance between the sun and the earth, it averages out to be about 94 and a half million miles. We'll call that an astronomical unit of distance, by the way. Now, even at that distance, it still only takes light eight minutes and 19 seconds to travel from the sun to the earth. Now, there are some measurements where even the speed of light is simply too slow to be used in calculations, if you can believe that. So we use what's called a parsec. Now, parsecs are 3.26 light years or 19.2 trillion miles. Now, we may do a separate video on the details of a parsec, but for now, the most important part is that it's slightly more than three and a quarter light years. So now that we have an understanding of the immense distances and how to calculate it, Let's look at how to measure the light coming from those stars. Now we measure total brightness by its magnitude. It might seem counterintuitive, but the lower the number, the brighter the star is. So a one magnitude star is brighter than a five magnitude star. Now our sun is used as a reference for magnitude, so it is a one magnitude. Hey everyone, I wanted to give you a quick update on that. Uh, I have a correction here. Everything you heard uh, me say about magnitude here is correct, except for one glaring mistake. Uh, the magnitude of the sun is not one. It is not used as a reference. I got that completely wrong. Um, the actual magnitude of the sun is negative 26.74. And I guess that makes sense. Anything that would be less than that number would be brighter to us in our eyes. Uh, so there's nothing brighter to us uh, than the sun in our own sky. So uh, again, everything else was right. I got the number wrong. It is definitely not one. It is negative 26.74. This brought to you as a correction. Thanks so much. Now, anything brighter than our sun is less than one. This includes negative numbers, and anything dimmer than our sun is a number greater than one. We also have two ways of defining magnitude. We have apparent magnitude and absolute magnitude. The apparent magnitude is how bright something is to our eyes from the Earth. Now, obviously, the farther away two stars of the same brightness, the dimmer they would look to our eyes. This is why we have absolute magnitude. It creates an artificial spot in space 
32.6 light years away that we place the star in and then theoretically measure how bright it would look if it was there. This then allows the stars to be properly compared to each other. Now there's a chart that scientists use called the Hertzsprung-Russell chart or the HR diagram. Now we can use this to plot the stars based on their absolute magnitude and their surface temperature. The surface temperatures come to us as a color with deep blue being the hottest of the stars and red being the relatively cooler stars. Now this is important because the hotter the star, the faster it is burning its fuel. The larger the star typically it is and the shorter its lifespan. Now as an example, our sun burns yellow at a relatively mild temperature of 5,778 degrees Kelvin compared to some stars that burn hotter than 30,000 degrees Kelvin. But those hotter stars may only last for a much considerably shorter span of about a million years, as opposed to our sun's roughly 10 billion year lifespan. Our sun, by the way, is through about half that lifespan. At the end of our sun's life, it will turn into a red giant as the mass of the sun is burned through and thus the gravity cannot contain the expansion until it finally shreds apart and what we're left with is a remnants in the form of a white dwarf. This actually is a good time to focus more on the life cycle of a star because just like humans, every star has a beginning and an end. Much of that life is a balancing act between the two opposing forces. As the sun burns more fuel, and increases the pressure pushing it out. But remember that unlike our planet, the majority of stars' size is a gas, so it can expand and contract like a gas does. Now, as a star gains more mass, its gravity increases, thus pulling that gas in. So a star develops a balance over time of pressure pushing out and the gravity pushing in or pulling in. This is why hotter burning stars are larger. They exert more pressure pushing out. And why as a star burns through its mass, the gravity gets less and the gas can also expand. Now a star actually starts primarily from a nebula. A nebula is a cloud of gas and dust. Most of the nebula is made up of hydrogen and a little bit of helium. Now a nebula can get its material from the explosion or death of a star long ago. Our very sun may just be the most current version of past stars. Who knows? Maybe there were even planets with life forms on them circling a previous star that made of the same material as our sun. Now I have a separate lesson on black holes where I go into this later life cycle, as well as in greater detail since there is only certain types of stars that can create a black hole. But it all starts as a baby would in their mother's womb. Now a baby star will start as a ball of condensed gas and matter in a nebula. As a baby gets larger, so does this condensed gas. We call this ball of gas a protostar. As it gets bigger and bigger and contains more mass, its gravity is going to start to increase. This increased gravity begins to pull in the neighboring matter and the protostar gets more and more massive. Now, as its mass increases, the molecules are starting to slam into each other at greater speed and frequency. Now, remember our conversation on temperature and heat. In this case, the temperature of the individual molecule is increasing as well as the overall heat of the larger amount of molecules in that space. Now, over a very long period of time, this activity of gaining more mass and getting hotter may suddenly become a star if the core gets dense enough and hot enough to sustain hydrogen fusion, which is where two hydrogen atoms slam together and they fuse together into an atomically heavier helium atom. This happens when the temperature reaches an incredible 10,000 degrees Kelvin. This is when fusion starts, and it's also when we officially say we have the birth of the star. Now, when a star begins nuclear fusion, it will be, move relatively quickly into a state of balance between the gravity and the pressure. Now, this is balanced by the total force and the total gravity generated by nuclear fusion. It will spend most of its life at this mature phase. Now, most of the mass of the star was formed by hydrogen atoms, and so it may be counterintuitive but higher mass stars have much lower lifespans than lower mass stars. This is because the larger gravity of the larger mass stars causes the temperature and heat to be much higher than the lower mass stars, thus being larger when fusion starts and burning hotter. They will burn through their material at much faster rates. So these massive blue stars, like we said before, last a relatively short million years, as opposed to a smaller cool red star that could last as long as a trillion years. 
Now our sun is considered a medium mass star, so it would last between 10 to 20 billion years. We think closer to the 10 billion year mark for our sun. Now it appears a nice bright yellow. Now when it gets near burning off its hydrogen supply, the gravity will lessen and will no longer be able to contain the pressure from the hydrogen fusion. The decreased gravity will cause the sun to expand and cool since there will be less molecules bumping into each other and thus lowering the overall heat of the space it occupies. Now the sun will become much larger than it currently is. It's expected that it will grow big enough to actually swallow up the earth, maybe even Mars. So goodbye earth at this point. Now it's going to continue to grow until the heat can no longer support the nuclear fusion. When this happens, it's going to shred its outer area and the gravity of the core will be the strongest force, thus collapsing brilliantly into a white dwarf. This white dwarf may only be about the size of the Earth, but it will have such an intensity that it will be nearly 100,000 degrees Kelvin. That's why it's so bright and white. But even though it is incredibly hot, it actually doesn't have any fuel left to maintain nuclear fusion. But with so few molecules in space to interact with it and transfer that heat to, it will take billions and billions of years to cool off. Once it has done so, we expect the brightness caused by that heat to go dark and cold. We would call that a black dwarf star. But given the relatively young age of the universe, they don't think there has been enough time for the formation of any of these black dwarf stars. So it's still just a theory. They can't see it. So stars that have much more mass than ours are called a high mass star. They start and live their lives, as we have already described, just as more mass and dense and larger and hotter than they are because the difference occurs at the end of its lifespan. Now, depending on the exact size, several different things may happen. The star could move from nuclear fusion of hydrogen to other elements such as oxygen, nitrogen, and iron. But eventually, when we get to iron, the fuel is going to run out. And when that happens, that star is going to explode, causing an incredible supernova. The force of that explosion will scatter the remaining elements into all directions, giving the material to start a new nebula to begin the birth of new stars. Now, the heavy elements are also what formed you. So you are truly made of stardust from a long ago exploding star. Very cool to think about in my opinion. So what's left at the center of the supernova will either be a neutron star, if it has less than three times or less the mass of our star, or it can become a black hole if it's much bigger than that and larger than three times the mass of our sun. Now this lesson isn't going to cover black holes, but just want to point out, at the center of a black hole, there is probably a very bright and solid object, just like our sun or white dwarf. The difference is that the mass is so dense that it creates such a large force of gravity that any light that is generated by that star can't escape it, and it traps any light that's going past it. But just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Now, black holes are an emerging science, and we have recently just got our first mathematically generated picture of one, thanks to the incredible teamwork and brilliance from people all across the world. Now, I've mentioned it in a previous video, but this module actually stated it as well. If you took our sun, and replaced it with a black hole of the same mass, which would only be about the size of New York City. The gravity would be the same since gravity relies on the amount of mass, not the size. So the planets would remain in their exact same orbit that they do today. The difference is that the gravity at the surface of the sun is not high enough to capture the light. And to be clear, it can bend light. We're gonna talk about that in another video, but it can't capture it, so we can see it. Now, a black hole, however, is much smaller for the same amount of mass. As such, the denser and smaller surface areas would capture the light that would travel near it or off of it. But at the radius of the sun, the black hole would have no more effect on light than our sun does. This boundary where light is captured versus escaped is called the Schwarzschild radius. And in our case, it would only be about 1.9 miles in radius. So this is very close. So light generated from the black hole wouldn't be able to escape, so it would be black. But most light that would be near the black hole would be allowed to go around it. Now, we do believe that there is a huge, massive black hole at the center of our galaxy that formed when there was an incredibly more massive star and exploded in a supermassive 
black hole was formed. Now, at the other end of the spectrum is the low mass stars. These stars are mentioned earlier, and they live very long lives, possibly being some of the last surviving objects in our entire universe as it continues to expand. They are between half the mass of our star, all the way down to about 8% the mass of our star. Because of their low mass, they burn cooler and they look red to our eyes. Now, Proxima Centauri is actually one of the closest stars we have that we know of to our planet. And it's a red dwarf sun. But because its absolute magnitude is so high, meaning it's dimmer, it cannot be seen except aided by a telescope. Now, eventually these stars will end much like our own, as a white dwarf, and eventually after it cools off as a smaller black dwarf star. Now, the last star we are going to talk about isn't a star at all. It's the dunce of the universe. It's never got enough mass to form, so it sits in a weird place between a protostar and a low mass star. And we call them brown dwarf stars because they can come off looking brown if you can see them. They don't have enough collisions within their molecules yet to support nuclear fusion. So they are very dim, making them very hard to detect. They are typically smaller than 8% the mass of our sun. Now, sometimes instead of one star, you can get two stars that will orbit each other. Now, we call these a binary star system. Scientists believe that binary star systems eventually collapse into one primary star. Personally, I would love to see a time lapse of this happening. Spin, 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 closer, boom. I want to see what that boom looks like. Um, lastly, when we have a collection of stars in the sky, our ancient relatives would create groupings based on animals, people, objects, imagined gods. Now, we call these collections of stars constellations. There's a total of 88 constellations. If you can find the Big Dipper, you can identify at least one constellation. It's great to be able to identify at least a few constellations as if you ever get lost and your cell phone battery dies and you can't use your GPS, you can do what the explorers did in the past and you can use the stars to help guide your direction. They're always going to be in the same place moving around the planet. Well, that's it for today's video. If you've enjoyed this video, please do consider hitting that subscribe and like button. It really goes a long way towards helping uh, the YouTube algorithm, making this video available to others. Now, if you're also from CAP, you can pause the video here as you will need to know these terms for your aerospace dimensions test. And if you also are from CAP, please go ahead and put your squadron's name down in the comments section below. I actually keep a map of all my visitors to the channel and where everybody's from. So thanks everyone. I hope to see you for video three in this series where we are going to move beyond our star and talk about our solar system. Till then, I hope you have an incredible rest of your day and thanks so much. Bye-bye. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed that video. If you did, please do me a favor, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more content. Up here on the left-hand side, you're going to see another video from our, uh, this playlist. And if you click down here, you're going to see another video on our channel. Hope you guys all have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.